We're in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in 11, but we're going to really start discussing in 13, because we touched on 11 and 12 uh, last week. 11 and 12, can, you can kind of consider them a broad brush stroke for the rest of the chapter. He gives a, a statement, and then he gives some more specific things for them to think about. They lived in a society that had all kinds of problems. When we look at them through our lens, through our society's lens, uh, there were things going on in the Roman Empire at this point that were unconscionable to us. We, we would never imagine these things happening in our neighborhood, but they were. And both Peter and Paul recommend living as good citizens no matter what. Living uh, in the Roman Empire in the first century, and you're talking about a society that would eventually kill both Peter and Paul. Right? The emperor Nero would kill both of them before things were over. And both of them say the best thing for you to do is live as a good citizen and treat people well. So it, it, we can take it and apply it to ourselves in difficult situations, but they really they had it bad. So we're going to read all the way from 11 down to 25, and then hopefully uh, get through uh, discussing all of chapter 2 tonight. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he has a conscience of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So the first several verses all kind of fall under the, the general heading of submit. Right? Be in submission. And our taste does not run toward submission in this country. People do not like the concept of being taken advantage of. They don't like the concept of letting somebody else have the upper hand. Uh, being a servant to someone else is just really becoming more and more a foreign idea in our country. There still are people that you know have great reputations for being that way, but for the most part uh, the kids that I taught shamelessly avoided the idea of being a servant or playing second best to anybody. You know, that it was against their judgment to let somebody else have the upper hand. Uh, when I was teaching philosophy, ran across something that Socrates and Plato uh, wrote down. Socrates didn't write, but Plato wrote stuff down about Socrates. And it tells you what the Greeks thought about their society, what they, how they kind of envisioned things. And it might help you 
understand a little bit about what Peter is saying here and being submissive to all these different groups of people. Uh, Socrates said that the ruling class is like the head of the body. It's where the brains are. It's where the intelligence lies. Uh, the ruling class should be very intelligent and they should be seekers of wisdom, lovers of wisdom. The word philosophy means one who loves wisdom. But wisdom is wasted on people that are not in the ruling class. Right? So you have to already, you have to be born into that station in life and you have to be uh, raised up with that kind of understanding. If you really want to have wisdom, you have to be born into the right class. Then there's the military class. And he says they're like the heart of the matter. Their best uh, benefit is to be courageous, to be willing to step up and do what needs to be done. And they might be taught, if they have a good enough heart, to rise up to the level of the nobility and learn about philosophy. And then there's the working class. He said they're just the loins. They're just the ones that the best they can hope to do is to listen carefully to our instructions and be obedient. Right? That's all that class of people is good for. So when Peter writes to this group of Jews, he's writing to a group of people who are mainly in that lower echelon of the Roman Empire. And all that's really expected of them is to be good servants, to do what they're told to do, and to respect the people that are above them. Uh, that was the way society worked all the way up until, uh, really, democracy in the United States was what kind of began to undo that kind of thinking. Even Europe in the 15, 16, 1700s still had that idea. If you're born into the aristocracy, you're a certain class, and then there's this working class, and then there's just everybody else, and you live to serve. So when Peter writes to these people, they were used to that idea. And Peter doesn't try to tell them to throw that off. He doesn't tell them that they need to uh, take their freedom that they've gained in Christ and show everybody around them that they're just as good as everybody else. He says the best thing that you can do is meld into society and do what's expected of you because then people will see you as good citizens and they won't have any reason to complain about you. And he gives several examples of things that they need to be in subjection to, right? You need to be in subjection to the king. Well, at the time that Peter writes this, I believe we're in the section right before Nero, okay? But the king was the emperor of the Roman Empire. If there was anybody that they didn't like or anybody that was a problem for Christianity, it was the Roman Empire, and it was getting worse. In the next 30 or 40 years, we would get to the point where the emperors wanted to be worshipped as God. And if you wouldn't worship them as a God, then you couldn't do business. And if they came back to your house the second time and said, well, burn a little incense and say Caesar is Lord, if you wouldn't do it the second time, they might drag your kid off into slavery. You do it the third time, they might drag you off into slavery or just kill you on the spot to make an example of you so that everybody else would remember their place in society. So to be in subjection to Nero or to be in subjection to uh, Domitian, who was in the 90s when John was on Patmos, to be in subjection to those guys was to be in subjection to somebody that was ungodly, horrible in their treatment of human beings in general, and that had a hatred for Christians. And Peter says, honor the king. Right? Give him the honor that's due to him as a king. Uh, over in Romans 13, Paul gives us that section about uh, be subject to all the higher authorities because there's no such thing as a higher authority that's not established by God. Right? Uh, government was God's idea, is what Paul tells us. So we've got to be in subjection to that. So throw away you know, our idea of what it means to be a citizen of the United States and have rights and you know, we get to vote and decide and all those kind of things. And put yourself in the position of these guys. 
second, maybe third generation Christians in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, they're only 30 some odd years away from the cross. It's a new movement and more and more hatred is coming against them. And Peter says, don't fight back. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. And he starts with the king, and then he talks about governors, local authorities. And then he says, and if you're a slave, how should you respond to your owner? Well, I'm free in Christ, but I'm still owned by another human being. And the Roman Empire, just they had more <laughs> slaves than free people. They, uh, one estimate in Rome about this time, there were two slaves for every free person in Rome. They had conquered so many people and dragged off so many slaves. So you had uh, Jewish slaves and Palestinian slaves and Egyptian slaves, uh, slaves from Europe, slaves from just everywhere in the world that Rome had attacked and defeated, they would drag back these big wagon trains full of slaves and sell them off. And Peter says, if you're a Christian, your attitude toward your owner has got to be one of submission. Do what they tell you to do. And then he goes so far as to say, if you're doing what's right, and they beat you anyway, then you can count it as a blessing. Right? That's, that's commendable. God can commend you for being patient as a Christian and taking a beating that you don't deserve. But if you're rebellious and you get a beating, well, why would God commend you for that? You deserved it because you belonged to that person and you were rebellious. Do you see how difficult it is to take what was going on in uh, Rome and to among the people that Peter was writing to in the first century and just you know throw it over into our situation? We can say, well, you've got a job and your boss is a mean person. But if you treat them well, maybe they'll notice that you're treating them well because you're a Christian. Maybe one of your coworkers says, why are you always so nice to the boss? They're a horrible person. And you could say, well, I treat them well because they're my boss, and because I'm a Christian, and I want to, to do the very best I can. So I submit myself to them. Well, that's okay. That's kind of the same category, except they don't own you. And tomorrow, if you decide you don't want to be submissive anymore, you go get you another job. Go do something else. Maybe that guy gets fired, and they hire somebody that's nice. So you... It's not exactly the same as it was for Peter's audience. But Peter and Paul both say, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, don't try to get free. Now, if they'll let you be free, fine, but don't run away. If they'll be nice to you, that's fine, but don't rebel if they're not. Live the life that God has brought you to live in whatever circumstance you might find yourself. So it's, it's almost impossible to just take this passage and move it over to, to 2020. And here's the reason he gives. Uh, verse 21. To this you were called. Right? The reason that you need to, to put up with this ill treatment, this unfair treatment, is you were called to this. It's your purpose. Right? You weren't saved just so you could be safe. You were saved so that you could bear witness to the change that happens when you're a Christian. So when people see that you're different from everybody else, remember we were over here talking about be holy because I am holy. God is other, so we have to be other. Peter says they're not going to notice who you are if you're just the same as everybody else. But if you're different from everybody else, if your owner has 20 slaves and they beat all 20 slaves, and 19 out of 20 rebel, but the 20th doesn't, somebody's going to notice. Well, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you joining us in the rebellion? Well, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to rebel. That kind of differentness 
shows up. And so Peter, remember the, the introduction, uh, live in such a way that on the day of visitation, these guys can glorify God. They'll realize that there's something different about you. So it's, your, it's who you are. Uh, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you and left you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Uh, who killed Jesus? Jews. Jews, okay. The Jews turned him over to the Romans because they believed he was blaspheming. That was the, the charge that they put against him. They said, are you the son of God? And he said, yes, I am. So they got him for blasphemy. When they took him to Pilate, what was the charge that they gave before Pilate? Pilate couldn't care less if he blasphemed. It was insurrection, right? He you know, says he... Said that, uh, he didn't yep. part of That's it. Pilate says, I don't see anything wrong with him. But the charge that they levied against him before the Roman court was, he says he's a king. And nobody can have a king, somebody saying he's a king, and let him live because we are all good subjects of the Caesar. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of hypocrites. But anyway... They turn him over. Which one of any of them had anything on him? Well, none of them. He never did anything wrong. Right? So Peter says, if you suffer for doing what's good, that's commendable. God can look at you and say, well, there's my child, there's my servant. They're being submissive even in the face of being treated unfairly. And your example is Jesus was a perfect man, and they killed him. So he didn't open his mouth. He didn't fight back. We sing that song, he could have called 10,000 angels. Uh, I don't think he'd have needed any help. You know, they could, he could have used some angels, but I don't think he needed them. Uh, he could have done anything he wanted to do. One of, my, one of the passages of Scripture that kind of keeps me in my place is they were calling up to Jesus and they said, if you are really the Messiah, come down off the cross. And I've always thought to myself, that's why Jesus was the perfect example, the perfect sacrifice, because everybody I know, including me, would have come down off the cross. Right? At that point, you, you're taunting me, you're, you, you've beaten me, you've crucified me, I'm in pain, and now you're yelling out things like, if you're really the Messiah, come down. There'd have been a lot of dead folks, you know, just come off that cross and, and fix that situation. But he doesn't, he stays up there. And so Peter says, if Jesus can die for you, then you can be humiliated for him. And maybe it changes the way people see things. Maybe people see the way you live and they decide that they want to be like that. They want to know what, what it's like to live that kind of lifestyle. Um, so then you, then you get down into verse uh, 23, they hurled their insults at him, and he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Uh, the ultimate key in everything that Peter says is you have to trust that God is taking care of all of this. If you if for one minute you think that you have to be in charge of your own justification, if you have to be in charge of your own uh, vengeance, right? He beat me, so now I'm going to rebel. He treats me poorly, so I'm going to be a poor slave. Uh, the government doesn't treat us right, so we're going to rebel against the government. Uh, Caesar hates Christians, so Christians hate Caesar. If, if that's your mindset... You can't be useful in the kingdom. But if you're willing to let God be in charge and realize that God can take care of all this stuff with or without your help, then you've got an opportunity to be useful. Not by fixing the problem, but by allowing God to fix the problem while you're being part of the display. Right? God can use me to show somebody else what it's like to be a Christian. If I don't live like a Christian, then, you know, as Peter says, what good is it if you get beat for doing wrong? You deserve it. Why, why celebrate that? 
All right. And then finally, in verse 25, there's a really neat uh, passage. He says, you used to be like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Right. This is one of the only places uh, where we get two elder words together. Peter likes these words, by the way. Shepherd is, a, is an elder word. Overseer, uh, presbyteros, uh, is a, uh, well, let's see. Uh, get my words right. Presbyteros, uh, poimain is the shepherd, and episcopos is the overseer. So you've got the older men who are the overseers, the ones who look out for and shepherd the flock. So there's two of those words right here in this passage. But the thing that, that catches my attention is you used to be over there. You used to be lost sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer, to the one who is making sure that you're safe, that's making sure that you are okay. Look over at John chapter 10. And we'll look at how Jesus describes himself in one of his I am passages. In general, there are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. He likes to divide things up into sevens. There are seven miracles and seven I am statements if you count them that way. But uh, John chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse 2. When I get there. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by his name or by their name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They would never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. There is a, a kind of sheep in Iran, and I don't know why I discovered this, what, where I ran across this, but they are called Armenian Mouflon. And Armenian Mouflon are the only sheep in the world that have red wool, naturally. But they are the most skitterous sheep on the planet. The males disappear for several months at a time. You just won't see them until mating season. So they're, they're hard to ranch. They're hard to, to grow mouflon sheep for their, for their red fur. And the, the individual that brought that up made the, the point. They said, you never want to be an Armenian mouflon sheep. Uh, you want to listen to the Savior voice and come when he calls you. Armenian mouflon, if a, a, a stick pops in the distance... They run and hide. They're hard to get anywhere near or, or treat with any kind of uh, medicine or anything that they might need. You can't get to them to help them. Uh, they're, they're almost useless at times. But Jesus says, the ones, my sheep, I call them by name because I know them. And when they hear me call their name, they come to me because they know my voice. They don't listen to other voices because they know that the other voice is it the one that's their shepherd that's going to care for them? But they know when I call them that they should come because they know they'll get the things that they need. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. So uh, Peter was with Jesus when Jesus was saying all of those things. So you imagine all the, the thoughts that were swimming around in his mind as he wrote down, you know, you used to be lost sheep, but now you've returned to the overseer and the shepherd of your souls.